Test one, two. Test one, two. Good afternoon and welcome back from lunch and terrific worship. We're glad you came and stayed for the afternoon. A couple housekeeping details. If you have a cell phone, please turn it off. And if during the question and answer period you wish to ask a question, please go to one of the microphones so the guests can hear and so can these two gentlemen so they can answer you properly. My name is Lynn Moronska. I work here at Luther Seminary. My name is Lynn Morotska. I work here at Luther Seminary. I've known both of these gentlemen for years. They're on my follow their footsteps list. They represent fourth and fifth generation of public church leadership. And this morning in the sermon, we were told to get up, stand up, and speak up. That could be their family motto. The senior one, David, had leadership in the American Lutheran Church and then in the ELCA. And I'm going to quote from his book about being a servant leader. If Lutherans could not live in fellowship with each other in the world, the world would, they would never be the leaven in the wider social fabric. And one of the hallmarks of this family of leadership is that 
The extension of being Christian is to be a voice in the public square for the, those who are on the margins. That's part of who you are as a Christian. Peter, the younger one, has just completed service as the bishop of the St. Paul Area Synod. Prior to that, he was bishop in Milwaukee. And he is known for uh, building consensus. And he wrote a document called Common Foundation, Shared Principles for Overcoming Poverty. Every one of the common principles starts out, we believe, we believe. And that means all of us. And I understand the idea came from the first part of our Constitution, we the people. But this is the hallmark of these, this family of public leaders. We, we. So I invite you to enjoy the conversation between an uncle and a nephew who are public church leaders. David Preuss and Ro Peter Rognes. Thanks, Lane. Thank you. This is, um, I'm going to set the stage a little bit. Um, this is not so much um, simply listening in on a conversation between us. I'm seeing this as, as a, a whole lot of very significant stories out of the life and ministry of David Preuss uh, that happened. Um, some of them happened before uh, people that are sitting here were even born. Uh, but are a part of the life history of the church that we are a part of. Um, David is generally introduced as Bishop Emeritus of the American Lutheran Church, the presiding bishop of the ALC going into the merger. But much, um, I, one of the things I want, that I think is very significant in all this and ought not be lost on anyone listening to, the, to these pieces of history we're going to talk about is that um, if all we're doing is talking about what someone did as presiding bishop, it might be of interest to you, but you don't really relate to it as something that hits you where you are, because I don't suppose there's a whole lot of people in this audience that are thinking, now I better be learning how to be presiding bishop. Um, but virtually everybody in this room is part of a local congregation someplace. And much of what David is going to be talking about transpired in his life and out of his leadership when he was living the life of a, parish, of a local parish pastor, including the intersections with Martin Luther King, um, which is where we'll start. The stories of, um, some stories of David's involvement with Martin Luther King himself and where they may have intersected. Let me just set the context for the first story. Um, David uh, was uh, uh, early in his ministry a pastor, parish pastor in Vermilion, South Dakota. In 1957, he moved to Minneapolis to be campus pastor at the University of Minnesota, a position he only served in for about a year before he was called to be pastor at University Lutheran Church of Hope, not far from here, over in southeast Minneapolis. So he went there in 1958. In 1960, the American Lutheran Church was formed and a part of the structure of the American Lutheran Church was a board of youth activity and a youth department, some staff people in the national offices of the ALC. David was one of seven people who were appointed to the board of youth activity and, um, and was chair of that board. When the staff came to the board, um, in preparations for a youth gathering in 1962 with some recommendations, that set in motion some of the dynamics that, um, that I think are instructive as to just where were we as a church back nearly, um, well, half a century ago now. So why don't we start there, David, with your service. Uh, you, you're sitting on the board of youth activity of the ALC and um, say a little bit about the staff and their kind of vision and what all unfolded. I want to I want to start by saying something I I just want to get said, and once I've said it, then I'm relieved because I won't, won't take the chance of take the chance of forgetting it. No, I'm I, I'm also the techie. Here. Good for you. Thank you. But I want to tell you all how important Martin Luther King Jr. has been in my life. Living as a contemporary and. I, I think you're pretty close to the same age. And then having 
heard him on the radio to begin with, and then having, having had a few opportunities to be with him in various settings. He simply was one of my great teachers, inspirations, heroes, however you want to describe it. Now that's kind of old hat now, but I want you to know that it happened to some of us before many people had heard about Martin Luther King Jr. And this first episode that we're going to talk about in a minute, he was relatively unknown in the preparations we were making for a Luther League convention, the young people of our churches gathering in Miami, Florida, where I, as I recall, we assembled about 12,000 mostly high school age youngsters. And uh, our staff, I should say along the way, <laughs> I'll have so many sidetracks it'll be hard to keep me going straight. <laughs> but but the, the Board of Youth activity, it was, I can't get started, that'll take too long. But the staff had come in and said, we want to invite to be a speaker at the big youth convention we're having, Martin Luther King Jr. And those of us, the seven of us that constituted the Board of Youth Activity sat there and of course started reacting. Two of the members were dead set against it. Three of them were wafflers. Two of us were for it. And we, we spent most part of a day you know, convincing the other five <laughs> that, that, that we had to go with this. And so we invited him and he said yes to our great glory and goodness and happiness. And it didn't take long because at that stage of the game, the only thing that Martin Luther King really was known broadly for was the fact that he was a communist agitator. And uh, and so right away we started getting flack. And the worst part of it was it came mostly from the bishops of the church. Don't point at me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around a long time, but not that long. <laughs> no, <laughs> no and, and they sent us a message saying, we ask you to, to uh, revoke this summons to speak. And we had another meeting and another go around of this seven person board and we, we refused. And uh, things went ahead and the, and the youth convention was a marvelous affair. He, he just had, as he did in every gathering that I knew about, had there were 12,000 young people just in his grip. It was a fabulous event. And uh, the bishops, however, weren't satisfied yet. And so they let the then president of the church, Dr. Frederick Schutz, know that he, they expected him to put on the agenda for the national convention of the Lutheran church, a public hearing where people can express their feelings about this terrible thing that the Board of Youth Activity had done in exposing our young people to this, this communist agitator. And that convention then was coming up, I think, in October of that year. And the Luther League convention had been in the summer. Well, as they say in the Bible, we girded our loins and prepared for battle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and we got it. Uh, there was a public hearing at the convention where the, naturally they were leaders in the church at the time, much more than those of us, most of us that were involved on the other side were parish pastors. And, uh, and they made the case for this being a dangerous thing to do to expose our children to this controversial person. And on top of that, we don't know that the church ought to be in public affairs at all. So that it was a, uh, 
tense moment when Dave Brown, who was the staff person in charge, and I was the chair of the board, and we responded. It didn't take long after we started speaking to know where the audience was. It was split all right, but it was the, the, whole, the whole phalanx of the younger uh, half of the convention just, just started getting in line to speak in support of this action. Hmm. The upshot of it all was that by the time that public hearing was over, we never heard another peep. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they know where, where, where the constituency was. And the, most folks don't know that, that, that an awful lot of these silent Norwegians and Sweden <laughs> and, and all the rest of them, they weren't, uh, the, their heart was in the right place. Just an awful lot of them, especially the younger half. The older ones really were, they were captured in the previous generation by the idea that the church shouldn't be out in the public arena. And that was not our business. Your business was to stay in the pulpit and preach the gospel. And, uh, and that was understandable. You, they, I could always sympathize with that. It was part of what I'd rebelled against after all. So I knew what it was. But that settled the hash as far as our work in the American Lutheran Church was concerned. Almost. I don't know how much it was the case, but a few years later, after the ALC had just had a few years to discover how tough it was to merge churches, why they had a, a uh, restructuring, that's what they called it, you know, you always have to restructure when you don't know what else to do. And uh, so <laughs> we had this big restructuring. And the, th the one thing that they did that has grieved me ever since, and I'm so disappointed that I was never able to get a board of youth activity such as we had then reconstituted. Hmm. That, that, that little group of a half a dozen people that was just wiped out by the restructuring, it simply was a galvanizing agent in getting the young people rallied around the gospel, both in its verbal form and in its action form. And uh, it was a tough role. But I, I could go on endlessly on this and I quit. Okay. Uh, when he speaks of the Board of Youth activity, some of you may recognize names. You mentioned David Brown, who later was bishop down in Iowa. Joe Bash, who was uh, kind of a prophetic voice. John Schultz, uh, I think a few years later, Nelson Trout was in the mix. Yep. Um, great group of leaders. Um, talk a little about, um, uh, I suppose the clip that will be shown most often on TV on Martin Luther King Day is from 1963, the March on Washington. You were there. Yes, I was out. <laughs> I didn't spy glasses to see him up on the Lincoln <laughs> Memorial because I was back under the Washington Memorial with, with, I don't know, a quarter of a million, half a million people out between us. But uh, they had the loudspeakers out and of course we had no trouble hearing that magnificent speech. I, are you going to get me into the, the other meetings that I had with him? Yeah, well, just go ahead. You started uh, also the, um, you were part of a group that was convened, 50 or so of you, on when King was seeking to uh, launch the uh, religion and race yeah. organ. Yeah, let me, let me go back to that youth activity thing. I, I, I was designated host for Martin Luther King, so I picked him up at the airport, and I, I was trying to think about recollections of riding from the airport the half an hour into the, uh, into the convention. And uh, I don't know if I can remember the three points anymore. That's pretty tough for me to remember it more than two uh, as, as I've aged. But one of the things that he, when we were chatting, one of the things that he, he I guess I asked him 
And he responded to say, we're in this for the long haul. He said, this, this is not the fly-by-night affair. Remember, this was quite early in his becoming a major figure in the country. We're in this for the long haul. Secondly, we've got to get the white churches going. And, uh, and that was a part of then, several months later, I, I was called along with about 50 others from around the country, and uh, we had a meeting in Chicago to constitute a council on religion and race. Its function, they never had any staff or any money or any, any kind of real organization, but its function was to, to say publicly and as often as possible that, uh, that the churches are in this and they're, they're, they're marching with Martin and it helped. I wouldn't suggest that there's a major factor in the developing of a, of a nationwide support base for Martin Luther King, but it was certainly a part to be able to, in every state in the Union, be able to say there's a council on religion and race that has to do with the churches in this region standing in support of this prophetic figure. So let's move to um, the, the church's, church's locally role and your own experience. You were serving all this time as pastor of Hope Lutheran, not far from here, southeast Minneapolis. Um, and uh, that propelled you into both housing and education issues. Um, as we talked, the, um, uh, tell the story of the, of the first um, occasion for you to recognize what the issues were around housing discrimination. One long after I became pastor of the University Lutheran Church of Hope, that a very good looking young a black couple came to church and it was not difficult for me even with a fairly large congregation to spot them <laughs> and uh, when they when they uh, went out after the service and I was standing at the door greeting people and so I uh, told them how glad I was that they were here asked them what he was doing they were uh, the reason moving to Minneapolis is they had a little pattern. And he said that he was a, had already completed his graduate work as a heart surgeon. But he was here now, if some of you are old enough, you remember the, the people that really put the University of Minnesota in the business, uh, in, in, the, in the international limelight, the L Little High Brothers. And they were here studying, he was here studying with the Lulahai brothers. And they asked me if they could come in and see me. So a couple of days later, we had an appointment and they came over and it just started right out. We've been here for three months doing this graduate work <laughs> with the Lulahai brothers. We have not been able to find uh, housing any place close to the university. Well, that really took the wind out of my soul, the sales. They'd been living, some of you know, 10th and University. There, there used to be a motel right over there. They'd, they'd been living in that motel three blocks from our church for those three months. Well, it just was one of those gifts from God that one of our members had told me a week or two before that he had just bought one of these three-story walk-up apartment buildings in southeast Minneapolis. And, uh, and I was able to call him up and say, will you help? And he said, I've just got one left, and I'd be glad to have them. Well, that was the most encouraging thing I could get. And that got me started realizing that even our congregation in the university community was caught up in this red line business and all of the rest of it and uh, and so uh, uh, 
the Minneapolis Council of Churches sent out a request for volunteers for a fair housing committee, and so I volunteered. There weren't very, very, many, very many volunteers, and I was very quickly <laughs> made chairman of that operation, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the, we did a, a, another one of those jobs, a just little, little thing in the, in the big picture, but a part of what had to happen all, all over the country. We organized house meetings all over southeast Minneapolis, northeast a little bit, a little bit even over into St. Paul. I don't think I see any of the former St. Anthony Park pastors, so I can say that we stole a little of their property. <laughs> but uh, organized these house gatherings to talk about selling and renting to people other than white Americans. And uh, again, I don't know how much good it did. Slowly there was a few more families here and there. Rentals were not easy to come by in the university community, but a few of them showed up. I want to break out and tell you one of the saddest stories from my pastoral experience. I worked hard to get some of those folks to Hope Church. I wanted very badly to have some black people in this white ocean. And, uh, and we got four families. And I was pleased as punch we could get them. And had them for probably two or three years. Two of them had you know, uh, junior high and, and senior high children. And they, two, the two parental groups came to see me one day and said, you know, they wept, said, we have to leave this church. They indicated they, they, they loved it. And, but they said, our children have told us that they won't come here with us anymore because as a result of doing so in the schools that they were going to with a black population, they were being, you know, challenged, I guess is the kindest word you can say, for being whiteies, honkies. They were, they deserted to the enemy belonging to a white church. The, the depth, I, I, that was my introduction to, to the depth of feeling that existed in the black community. Prior to that, I suppose I had kind of thought that they were uh, pleased at the, when one of us or a few of us white people or even a white congregation would make some gesture or another. But I recognized then that if this was happening with their kids, that was, that gave me an, a, a new sense of, of the gulf and the size of the barriers that be, were going to exist between white and black Americans. And that's really just galvanized you to more action than otherwise, but it was a heavy blow at the time because those people were so important to our parish. Well, so, rescue me. So one of, the, uh, one of the arenas then of involvement that you had was as leader of the Fair Housing Council in the city of Minneapolis. Yep. Uh, it wasn't long after that that a desegregation order was handed down in Minneapolis as it was in many cities around the country for the public schools to begin more proactively desegregating and, uh, and you were propelled onto the school board at the time. Talk a little about that experience. Yeah, we had a good Southeast Minneapolis public organization made out of three uh, local housing groups, uh, Merchants Group and Dinky Town, and some uh, over there in the uh, university in Hennepin area. And, uh, as a result of our actions in trying to, to make sure that we continue to have decent schools, there's a lot of talk about closing up all the schools in Southeast Minneapolis. We didn't need them. The enrollment was slipping and so on. And so I, I'd been in, in the middle of that battle 
and a, a vacancy occurred on the school board, and so I, some of the local folk uh, started a rally to put me on the school board, and I agreed to that after my wife agreed to let me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> incidentally, she, she's, she was a noble soul in the way with five kids, the stuff she let me do and in, in the public arena. And putting, let me tell you, just, just one, one day she came home and, or well, she was at home, and the doorbell rang. And she came to the door and there were two policemen. And they said, we've gotten word that there's a bomb in your house. And she said, no, no, no. Mayor Art Naftalin happened to live next door. And, and so Anne said, no, no, Mayor Naftalin lives next door. No, no, we're not after Mayor Naftalin. This is Price. This is your house. And this, this was at the height of the troubles in the 60s. When in the school board we were setting out to desegregate the schools, I was a part of an urban coalition that was half black, half white, and trying to put together the posit something positive out of the terrific stirrings and burnings on Plymouth Avenue and on a rioting. And, uh, and as a part of that, why Anne got the burden of having to watch the, these two policemen go through her closets, <laughs> <laughs> which was the least pleasing part of the episode. Anyway, it was, it was that tough. We had the, the most scared, I've been scared a number of times. But the, probably, the, well, at least it was one of the most scared times was when, uh, when I was in the, uh, in the school board in this urban coalition, we were going to pair a couple of schools one that was heavily black and one that was white, and we're going to put them together. Well, that raised a storm, and there was a lot of, a lot of criticism of it. And, uh, and it opened up a number of conversations. I had one with about 12, 15 young black men who were accusing me, or the school board, of just wanting to get a bunch more black kids into the dummy classes. We, of course, in our thinking, figured that this was a way that we were going to, to improve the lot of everybody concerned. It wasn't seen this way by this bunch of young boys. They, they were in the Phyllis Wheatley Center, which some of you know, and I was invited to come over there to speak to them wasn't invited, I was demanded uh, as, as a representative of the school board. And so I was there with them and they gathered around me and I wasn't accustomed to having, number one, I wasn't accustomed to having 15 young 15 to 25 year olds around me, you know, moving all the time and uh, I, I interpreted it as being threatening. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I made a terrible mistake. I made an answer to something or another, and I said, boy, oh boy. Well, you know, that was like throwing gasoline in the fire because the assumption was I was using those as reference to them, where all it was for me was a, a natural idiom that I was accustomed to using. Anyway, I survived, and actually they were mainly, I discovered later, doing what they had to do. Whether this, this was important to them to make sure that I got the message loud and strong. They weren't going to put up with what they were having to put up with any longer. Hmm. And afterwards, I saw Nellie Johnston you're old enough, some of you know that she was a major figure, not only in the black community, but in the much larger community. When, 
when, when she and Josie Johnson and Gleason Glover and, uh, and John Warder and Harry Davis, incidentally, Harry Davis and I paired up to run for the school board as a team, which was a lot of fun. I got a lot of heat from that too. But we, we, we got more votes than anybody else in the whole operation, which again tells you something about the, the, the silent uh, mass of people whose heart was at least moving in the right direction. How did I, uh, Harry, Harry Davis, African American. Yeah, Harry Davis, yeah, the, yeah the, he was a fellow who had a gimpy leg from polio as a kid, and yet he became a champion, Golden Glove uh, champion at a national level. Came back here and played a major role, not only in the black community, he ran for mayor after the school board episode. But it was a great privilege to run with him as, for office in the city. One of the, one of the um, you were very obviously very active. You talked about um, uh, that it was important that Anne was supportive of you because this was pulling you away from home a lot. Um, but it was also, you were also serving as pastor of a local parish at the time when you were leaving that parish for this kind of involvement in the life of the community. Um, there are pastors who, um, believe it or not, who occasionally get into trouble for getting involved in issues that their parishes may not want them involved in. Talk a bit about your, um, how you went about that vis-a-vis -vis your own congregational leaders. Yeah. Well, there were two things. I tried to be a teacher as much as possible from the word go when I started. That, that Martin Luther talked about two kingdoms, and uh, one of them the, the, is in the church, one of them is the state. And we're citizens of both. But somehow the, the, the Lutherans got sidetracked post Luther. and. Uh, he got this notion that while there were two kingdoms, why all that the church had to do with was the church side. Had nothing to do with this public life over here. And if you started getting too busy in the public arena, there was something wrong with you. Uh, this was an act of unfaithfulness. And so I had an educational job, all of us did, to, to start helping people understand that you're not just a citizen of the church, you're a citizen of the state also. We're, you're beholden in a different way, but you're, God is Lord of both kingdoms, and we are people of both kingdoms. And as Christian people, we had a responsibility to show a little love for our neighbor by the way we conducted the public area of life. Well, that... That was one important part, and the other important part was I never did a thing without the support of the church council of the congregation. I saw guys really get in trouble, pastors, who went solo and discovered they didn't have anybody after them once the heat started to appear. I made sure that any, any if, when I, started active in the community over there when I went with this fair housing committee, when I went on the school board, I always took it up with the church council before I did it. So you had them in, on your side. I thought of it when she was saying about the betrayal of silence. You'll find a lot of betrayal of silence if you're a pastor and you go off on your own without any, anybody backing you up and uh, and most people, you know, all of us are good at self-preservation, and, uh, and most people just hunker down and shut up if trouble appears. So you better have them on your side before you start. If you was here, I'd tell you about Paul Quee, the, Dr. Paul Quee, a medical school professor who was the president of our congregation. And brother of Governor Alquee. And brother of Governor Alquee. And, and the way Paul would stand up and say, this is what we did. This, we decided to support Preuss in this. You know, 
uh, well, uh, there were plenty of them that would figure, figure this crazy endeavor that he was getting himself mixed up in. But you know, to have him stand up and, and say, this is where we want him to be. I never had any trouble in the congregation. So I mean, those two things, and the, th the third thing was that I always made sure that I preached the kind of gospel that would please the people who thought the church should stay out of that sort of stuff. I, one of my great triumphs was to have one guy in the parish who used to come and tell me after we'd get some publicity about what we'd done with the schools or whatnot, and, and he'd get after me. He, he was really from the other side. But he came to me one day and he said, I suppose you wonder why I stay in this congregation. And I said, yeah, the thoughts crossed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, you preach the gospel. He said, I don't agree with all of that stuff you, you, you're talking about over here, there, elsewhere. But you preach the gospel. And that's good enough for me. Let me, uh, so let me ask a fo follow-up, um, kind of a theoretical question um, that, I, that I'm sure would occur to many of our pastors who are drawn into the, uh, feeling drawn, um, compelled into the public arena um, and would hear your advice that don't do it without the backing of the church council and they may say, I got a really conservative church council and they don't want, they're not, they're not going to want me doing any of that. For, for instance, if, if, um, if that African-American uh, heart surgeon had, uh, had come to you and said we can't find any housing and you were, began to realize um, how unfair uh, or how lacking fair housing was, you were drawn into that arena and your church council said, uh-uh, you, you, preach about Jesus, but you stay out of all of that other. What would you have done? Yeah, I, I would have taken that, those two kingdoms and said, look, I'm a citizen of both of these kingdoms that God has got going here. And, uh, and as a private citizen, I'm going to do what I can over here. And I, I, I'll, I'll make sure everybody understands that I'm speaking as a private citizen, not as the pastor of, of Hope Church. Because, you know, there's no way usually to stop people from saying he's pastor of Hope Church when they're introducing him or whatever. And uh, I never had to do that, but that was what I was ready to do. It would have curtailed my ability to act because I was able to do a lot of things because I, I felt the congregation was in back of me and, and uh, encouraging me. I would have had to cut down a lot of stuff if I had had to go out on my own totally. So while there was some of that that I had to feel like I was doing, I, the area got fuzzy and I always took the best possible opinion <laughs> that suited my desires. Let me ask one other, uh, one other question, but I'm aware of, uh, we wanted to allow some time for any questions about any of this or anything else that uh, you'd like to raise with David. Um, so be thinking of that. I'll, in a moment, have you come to the microphone. Um, back to your body of experience, everything that we have been talking about, both your involvement with uh, Martin Luther King himself and, um, and your involvement in in the world of King's passion, the issues of civil rights and where we were as a society at that point, all of that took place during your time as a parish pastor here in Minneapolis. Um, you, uh, but you went from that into your role then as head of a national church body. Um, what, um, what council, um, and here we are sitting in the midst of an institution whose mission it is to prepare leaders for the church of the future. What counsel would you have drawing on your broad experience as president of the whole church um, to people preparing for ministry um, in this year and the years ahead 
in terms of how to how to how can we most effectively lead in the arena of of justice and care for the neighbor as a church well certainly there has to be a, a, a teaching element at work here and and I've followed this seminary and its uh, life enough to know that there's been just a lot of effort and I'm sure it's been uh, with, with great payoff to prepare pastors for a ministry that is broader than the narrow gauge stuff where you divide two kingdoms severely and so that to help them understand what kind of ministry is possible in the public arena while you're at, at, at the same time working to develop the congregational strength to, to be able to peel out of that into the public arena. It's a neat trick because you have to at the same time you have to have your work cut out for you to, to get people to keep the congregation moving and going. And there are a lot of jobs that need to be done in the congregation. And the temptation is to take all of your best leadership and keep them so busy taking care of the parish stuff that they, they never make the jump over. But uh, beyond the teaching at the seminary and uh, amongst themselves, I don't know really. I, it's something you, you, you either got or you don't get. I got that, it. That may be, um, let me make one observation and then we'll see what questions anybody has. Um, I, 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 I'm not only your nephew, but, um, but I overlapped, that is I served as a district bishop for two years, your last two years as president of the ALC. Uh, so I saw you a little closer than many in that leadership role. And I think a key to what you brought was um, that you were, you were not uh, hidden or manipulative. You were very clear in what you thought and what you, what you were in favor of and not in favor of. You'd make your case strongly. Uh, but you, all, you did it with a... With a um, reservoir of respect and, uh, and space for those who wanted to make a contrary case and those who felt differently. Uh, and it seems to me that, that a leader who is able to, um, to, to grant that kind of, uh, of respect and space for someone who holds a contrary opinion then ultimately wins not only their trust as a leader but, uh, but the trust of the whole body is raised, recognizing that you aren't simply battling for a particular vantage point or a particular conviction you have, but are embodying a care and a respect for the whole community, uh, which frankly, in both in church and society, I think is in short supply. Someone who can convey, and, and a pastor, it seems to me, is perfectly positioned uh, to be able to represent that community. After all, we are a community that is, that is gathered around a core conviction uh, about the gospel, uh, and that's sort of our only uh, membership card, and that allows for a space for what shape does love of neighbor in the world take. We might differ about that. Yeah. You might have... Uh, you might have a socialist and a capitalist in terms of their their political um, their political persuasion, but but if what gathers us is is uh, that we are followers of the God we meet in Jesus Christ, then we're propelled into the world to care for the world. Capitalists and socialists can have a lively conversation about which avenue cares for the world best, but it's it's the core that the pastor represents as the proclaimer of the gospel and the gatherer of the community. You modeled that marvelously. You were very clear on what, uh, as you said, your member who disagreed with you politically liked what you said on Sunday morning. The gospel was at the center. You've said it better than I could. 
I don't need to add to that. I do want to get two other things said, though, that I, I forgot along the way. One of them was the inspirational occasions, not only that, that hosting of uh, Martin Luther King at the Luther League Convention, but secondly, in Council on Religion, that meeting in Chicago, to be sitting at the table next to the big honkers. You know, I was a parish pastor, and, and uh, no designs on anything else or expectations. And to be in, in this setting, where here's Martin Luther King, here's Abraham Heschel, who Mark Colden there at least would know who he was, um, the finest uh, Jewish theologian that is, this country has produced to this date, and a great supporter of Martin Luther King. Archbishop Iakovos of the Orthodox Church. These are the two guys that were the quickest to rally out of the, the major leadership of religious organizations. And, and these two fellows sitting on either side of, of Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, and, and down the line, you know, these were, these were giants in my parish pastor's vision. And to be sitting at the table next to them, overhearing their conversation and trying to uh, not listen to my table so I could hear what was going on <laughs> at the next table. That was one experience. And the other one was Superintendent John Davis and I flew down the morning after Martin Luther King had been killed and marched with the sanitation workers in that Memphis Day March that Martin Luther King was to have led. And, uh, and the only word we got was that where we were to get in line and, and there was to be no talking. As I recall, it was about two miles from where we assembled down through the streets of the city. And the governor had assured us that that there would be, uh, he'd called out National Guard, and there'd be National Guardsmen protecting on the way. <laughs> the reason I mention that is because it's, it has always struck me strange that all along the way here, every six feet for two miles, was, was a, uh, an armed uh, mm -hmm. military person there to protect the marchers. But the strange part of it was that they were all of them facing the marchers, not the 10 deep people on the side, uh, you know, the expectation being somehow that the marchers were going to be the ones that are going to cause the problem. It won't be somebody out there, hmm. which again was the kind of, of striking uh, stereo typical stuff that you get. I would have felt a lot safer if they'd been facing the other way. I'm told we're supposed to allow a few minutes and we only have a few minutes left for any other questions that may arise from within the group. Um, they asked you to come to one of these microphones. Please. Thank you, Bishop Preuss. I could listen to you all day long. <laughs> he told me when we were talking ahead of time that he could go all day long on these stories <laughs> too. So. He's had a good start so far. So Bishop Royce, you talked about um, being an early uh, adopter of the Martin Luther King themes at a time when he was considered to be uh, an eccentric and possibly a sinister communist sympathizer. What were the one or two things about his message that captivated you right out the chute? Well, certainly the first thing was, was that magnificent way in which he would just make clear, uh, I, I, just grabbing a little bit, when he said, we aren't interested in being your brother-in-law. We just want you to be our brother. You know, the, the way he, 
He was calling people to a common humanity. And uh, I've never felt other than, than that, that that's one of the basic principles that has, has to somehow get into the consciousness of human beings. That, uh, that for all of the variety that God has created in human beings, that they're human beings. And that there is a common basis there that, well, anyway, he was great at that. I could go on at length, you know, commenting on his preaching capacity. What a preacher. That uh, the first time I'd heard him was there at that Luther Lee convention. And he had a way of starting out so nice and kind of slow mm. and calm. And I thought, he's going to sound something just like a Lutheran preacher. And, <laughs> And, and then it picked up steam along the way. And of course, by the time you got to the end of the, se- the, the sermon, you couldn't wait to stand up and cheer. And that's as noisy as a bunch of Lutherans can get, you know. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was one big thing. And uh, the second big thing was just the guts, just the courage to tackle what he was tackling. I thought, I. I think I thought, <laughs> you know, reflecting backwards, you don't know how much you you really happened and how much you thought or kind of created subsequently. The uh, but sitting in that back seat with him and listening to him talk about the long haul, and there's just there's no turning back. And Selma and all of the. The real rough stuff hadn't happened yet. But he knew, in retrospect, he knew it was going to happen. And yet he was resolutely facing into it and saying, come what may. And that frequently inspired me. Because in my little, you know, you, each, you have, we've each got a little corner of the universe that we occupy and you, you, uh, you try to protect it and try to stay safe in it. Another question. I was wondering when, when Dr. King made that famous speech about Vietnam, what, did you, what was your reaction to all of that? Hmm. Well, by the time that, that he, when he started on that, I thought, what, what, is, what is he getting into that for? He's got enough on his plate without taking on the, the, uh, the, the whole operation of the Vietnam War. But as the days went on, it became more and more obvious to me that he was right. And I was among what I'm sure is a, a great proportion of the society, who, maybe a lot of us or a lot of folks waited until after he was gone to begin to understand the folly of the Vietnam War. But he had me convinced after a, a, uh, well, that hit not just Martin Luther King, but the, the whole circumstance. I think it was halfway through the Vietnam War that I, that I wound up being against the Vietnam War. I'd like to be able to look back and say, I opposed it from the beginning, but I, hmm. it wasn't the case. I was a loyal American, I thought, hmm. and had fought or had been a part of the army, at least in World War I. And, uh, and, to, and I was strong in support of that idea that we've got, to, we've got to build a wall to keep the communists out. And Vietnam was simply the latest effort to make sure that we kept the world clean. We have but, time maybe for one more question. I'm signaled. David, I really thank you for being here. Uh, I arrived at the University of South Dakota in 1954 as a son of an immigrant father, young and immature, and to have you and Anne and your young family as a pastor of that church and running the Lutheran Student Association out of there, what a wonderful example to have in front of me for my life. But I was wondering as I sat here, in the early days of those first couple calls, one in Brookings and one in Vermillion, what did you turn to for uh, strength? set that wonderful example in front of these people? I always 
did what I'd been taught at the seminary not to do. And that was to have friends in the congregation. There were always folks in the congregation. They were friends. And I, and I could, I, I, they, they came to me, I came to them. It was a, a fair exchange. And when I needed help, I especially, one of the great lessons that I learned and that made, made a supporter of, of feminism from fairly early on anyway, was I could always go to the women, the easiest. But of course, they'd tell me how to get to their husbands. And, uh, and then I'd go and get them and get them to get their butts out in front and, and take the lead that, that they ought to. But that, that, was, that was one of the great... They used to see, I can remember some of my seminary professors, and they were, they were good people, and, and they were from another generation, so I'm not trying to deride them. I, if I'd have been of that generation, I'd have probably been just like they were. But, uh, but we were warned, don't make f personal friends in the congregation, because then you're upset the congregation, you're playing favorites, and et cetera, et cetera. I couldn't do that. And as far as I know, I didn't have a problem. You know, to have had Paul Quee in the congregation and not have him as, as a, a friend that I could associate with at any level would have been crazy, I think. I think we're at time. I'm being signaled, but I, uh, thank you, David. And, I, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure whose idea, where the idea germinated out of the seminary planning for this day to have David um, share these kind of stories, but, uh, but I want to say thanks to whoever the, those planners were. Um, as I often describe myself as an unrepentant college history major, I don't think we ever understand fully where we are or what's unfolding unless we understand more fully the trajectory that brought us to where we are. You have been a, you have been a major part of the shaping of this church's life over the last half century. And for the seminary to say, That's, these are stories worth hearing and worth rehearsing in this kind of a gathering, I think. So I, uh, thanks to Luther Seminary as well for this piece of this day. Amen. Thanks. sessions are going to start right away. So if you want to grab coffee or a cookie, you can do so and then head to your breakout session. And then we'll gather here for closing worship at 3.30. So enjoy your breakout sessions.